All right, thank you. Uh, I am going to be talking about some tools, successes, and challenges for conducting speech perception experiments online. Uh, these slides and a more in-depth tutorial are available at my website um, shown here. So what I'm reporting on today are some things that have worked well for us in the past year as we've started porting some of our testing um, in lab to online platforms. The general pipeline we use or the general set of tools we use are prolific as the participant pool, Gorilla as the experimental builder and online server, and this Woods et al. headphone screen that we've already heard um, quite a bit about. With these tools um, and uh, some trial, a lot of error, um, and a lot of piloting, these are a set of procedures that we found to support our success in a host of different studies. Um, as has already been mentioned, we think a lot and do a lot of piloting to design the experiment to be only, only as long as needed. Um, we too aim for less than 20 minutes, and we do this because we've observed that data quality is better for shorter tasks, and that subjects tend to make their own breaks in longer tasks. This might manifest as the first trial of a certain block having a reaction time corresponding to five minutes. These aren't hard and fast rules. Um, I'm going to present some data from a study that was around 40 minutes. Um, but in general, we aim to be short. Some general logistics are we convert our sound files to MP3 and image files to JPEGs, um, in addition to providing clear instructions regarding autoplay and headphone requirements. We'd give people two chances to pass the headphone screen with a friendly reminder of the headphone requirement between screens, and we pay well um, at a prorated rate equivalent to $10 per hour. So I'm going to briefly walk you through six successes um, that we've had in online. All the data I'm going to show you are um, collected with, with these tools. And I've picked these six to try to give an overview of the variety of tasks, um, stimuli, and phenomena that we've been able to observe in online testing. So I wouldn't be a speech perception scientist if I didn't on occasion have participants make phonetic decisions for voice onset time continua. In this study, listeners completed two blocks of 152 trials, um, and across blocks, the VOT continua were shifted to provide either short or long VOT input distributions. And two successes are observed here. We replicate the robust uh, a phenomenon of categorical perception as indicated by the logistic response curves. And we also replicate distributional learning in that the uh, identification functions for the short VOT input are displaced to shorter VOTs than for the long VOT input. For each of these successes at the bottom of the screen, you'll see information about the sample as well as attrition. Here we had to exclude 52 people due to failure to perform the task a number that is higher than most of our studies and I think reflects the fact that this was an incredibly boring experiment. And we had to exclude 27 due to failure to pass the headphone screen. Success number two was measuring a Ganong effect online. We actually ran this study as a means of vetting stimulus set for um, a different experiment that we were going to use in in-lab testing. And participants here did two blocks of 160 trials of phonetic identification. One block was for stimuli from gift, kift, and gis, kiss, continua. The second block, control block, was 160 trials for the same stimuli, but we had excised the disambiguating lexical information. So in the control block, the stimuli perceptually ranged from ga to ka. Here, we excluded zero people due to failure to perform the task, and only three due to failure to pass the headphone screen. One thing that I've been really impressed with um, in terms of the quality of data that we get from the prolific participant pool is how well the patterns we observe at group levels match those that we observe at the individual subject level. Here I've shown the identification functions for all 20 participants in the Ganong block, the top two rows, and the control block, the bottom two rows. Um, and that to me looks like a very nice um, psychophysical data. Success number three was a lexically guided perceptual learning experiment. Here, listeners completed two blocks, one an exposure block that consisted of 200 trials of a lexical decision task, and then a test block that consisted of 72 trials of phonetic identification. 
The data that are shown here are for performance at test. And each of these plots, well, each of these functions shows 35 people. This was a study that I was really interested um, in, in learning whether we could port it online because the nature of the um, ambiguous productions to be learned consists of high frequency aperiodic noise, something that I thought might be sensitive to degradation of listening environments. Um, but as you can see here, we observe robust learning um, in both of these samples. These are two different stimulus sets. Uh, the note here at the bottom refers to the total sample size for three, the three experiments in the study. I've only shown data for one. And one thing I want to note here is that while our overall attrition rate is, is around 20%, that's about our average, um, you can really see the dissociation between the people who are excluded due to failure to perform the task, which is very few, compared to those who don't pass the headphone screen. Success number four, perceptual learning for noise vocoded speech. This is the longest experiment we've run online. It took between 35 and 40 minutes to complete. It consisted of a pre-test block and a post-test block. Each of these were 30 trials of a transcription task. So listeners were asked to type back what they heard for a series of noise vocoded sentences. In between pre-test and post-test, listeners completed 150 trials hearing noise vocoded sentences on each trial, and the task differed according to one of three training groups. And what you can see here is that we successfully replicated perceptual learning for noise vocoded speech. Accuracy, keyword accuracy is higher at post-test compared to pre-test for all three listener groups. Success number five is talker normalization and phonemic ambiguity effects on word identification. The next two studies I'm going to talk about are very much work in progress. I'm showing you some of our pilot data. And this for us is our first foray into using reaction time as a dependent measure in online studies. So in this study, participants completed four blocks of speeded word identification. Each block was 40 trials. And these four blocks were formed by crossing phonemic ambiguity, a low versus high ambiguity contrast, with a talker variability, either a single talker in the block or mixed talkers in the blocks. And what you can see here is that we successfully observe evidence of talker normalization. Reaction times are faster for single compared to mixed talker blocks. And we're also able to detect the phonemic ambiguity effect on word identification. Reaction times are faster for low compared to the high ambiguity contrast. 6x6 is uh, effects of talker familiarity on word identification. Here, listeners completed a familiarization block and then a test block. During familiarization, they heard 40 trials um, for a talker identification task with feedback. And between subjects, we manipulated whether they heard the same four talkers they were going to hear at test, the familiar group, or whether they heard four talkers that were not the same as those at test, the unfamiliar group. At test, listeners completed 80 trials of speeded word identification blocked by low versus high ambiguity. And again, we find evidence that response times are faster for familiar compared to unfamiliar talkers and for low compared to high ambiguity contrasts. One thing that's probably standing out to you in both of these plots is the range of between subjects variability relative to um, our, our fixed effects of interests. This is something that's not unique to online data collection, but it is something that I definitely feel is um, extended or maximized with online data collection. As an illustration, here are the distribution in the top panel, the distribution of reaction times for all the correct responses contributing to these data. And as you can see, the bulk of them form what we might expect to be a, a standard reaction time distribution, but we have a very, very long tail and some reaction times <laughs> um, that don't seem sensible at all, around 10 seconds. Um, after piloting and replicating um, some decisions we've made about how to trim these reaction time distributions in a principled way, a pipeline that seems to be working for us is to take a two-way approach to identifying outliers, one is to off the bat exclude reaction times over five seconds. And the second is to, by subject, 
exclude reaction times that exceed three standard deviations of their mean uh, reaction time. And across numerous samples, applying these two criteria for outlier detection does a lot in terms of giving us an overall reaction time distribution that's sensible, while at the same time reviewing a very, very small proportion of the data. And these two exclusion criteria work well for making a, a sensible reaction time distribution across participants, but also at the level of individual participants. So in terms of some challenges, our biggest one is headphone compliance. Um, it is without a doubt our greatest source of attrition. What is shown here um, is the, for the around 1,100 participants of these six successes, the proportion that we could use versus the proportion excluded due to task performance versus the headphone task. The um, headphone task carries the largest weight. In terms of addressing this challenge, um, I'm convinced that there's high sensitivity for headphone use in the Woods et al. screener, but I'd like to know more about 